Hi, my name is Amber Gregory. I was abused and raped by my dance teacher when I was 12, going on 13 years old. My upbringing was a little chaotic. My family was unchurched. I myself was religious because I had the opportunity to live across from a family, a minister and his family. And I went to Sunday school and, and was really a big part of that family when I was like four and five years old. My dad was an alcoholic. My mom is nice, but super enabling. And she asked my dad to leave when I was five years old. So there was no dad at home. All my siblings were teenagers. I was much younger. And that left me kind of playing by myself a lot. So I didn't have a lot of time and attention. I was loved at home, I wasn't abused at home, but at the same time, I, I feel like I was sort of raised by neglect. I started dance when I was nine. I was good at it and I loved it. And the woman who owned the dance studio was my teacher when I was nine. By the time I was 10, her son, who was five years older than me, was also teaching he became my dance teacher. And then in a couple years, when I graduated to the senior class, he danced with me in the class. He became a big part of my life, especially since I was at the studio five days a week. So this wildly talented, good looking boy, literally the superstar of our studio. Uh, he was really good at making you feel special and included. You know, he had that kind of personality. So initially, when he became my dance teacher, and then um, a little while, he started teaching my solos. I mean, that's where the abuse really started taking hold because he had me alone. So that's when he would do like small boundary pushes. I pushed my hair back behind my ears. So he was like doing light little touches. After a few months, he would give me little things. Like he gave me this little felt teddy bear with a heart. And it said, you are very special. And I knew the minute he gave me that, because we were alone, it was more than my dance teacher. He was thinking about me like he was a boy and I was a girl. It made my heart race. And then I started looking at him as if he were a boy. And then he would pass me notes. Like, and it, they would all say how special I was, how sweet I was. They were not lewd. They were not sexual. They were not overt. They were all about love and caring and kindness. And that's how it started. And I was falling for this fairy tale romance. It was romantic, very romantic, and all done in secret during my private lessons, which were done in the downstairs studio that has no window in it, never upstairs, where moms who waited for their kids might have seen something going on. This was all done in secret. And I didn't tell, I was being swept off my feet. I mean, I was getting so much time and attention. I was loving it. This felt so great. <laughs> I, was, I was so happy. He was saying all the right things. That's what happens, I think, in the beginning. Feels great, you don't want it to stop. After about four months, he called me over to the stereo system at the end of one of my private lessons. And he's, he's like, you know, he did like this kind of thing. And he was sitting on a stool, so he was down at my level. And he pulled me in for a kiss. And it was chaste. It was just a, a sweet kiss on the lips. And for me, it was, it was like a fairy tale kiss, you know? I mean, I, I don't know, it just was so romantic. But after that kiss, then the larger boundary pushes really started. You know, kissing was not so chaste. It became French kissing. Uh, him sliding his hands, not just on my shoulders, but down the front of me, you know, with my bodysuit on. Him grabbing my hands and touching him. But within a couple weeks, it was pushing to skin. And I wasn't stopping it. I think what happens is you become complicit in some of the stuff that's happening. And you don't want to say no because you like some of it. You like the, the notes and the romance and the special attention because it's not all dirty it's not all uncomfortable but some of it is starting to get uncomfortable but you don't want to say no to that because you don't want the nice stuff to stop and it, it, you get confused as a kid too as 12 and this was my first experience with anything so i'm this very naive 12 and i'm conflicted i don't want some of it to stop i'm getting uncomfortable with some of the things he's pushing towards and then the notes are still all these flower stickers and all these heart stickers saying how much he loves me and he thinks he's falling in love with me and it's like beautiful and he thinks you know he wants to marry me someday this is what grooming actually really is the tables turn and suddenly i wanted to say no to some of it when he put his fingers in me. I didn't want that, but I didn't know how to stop it because I had let him touch me under my bodysuit 
So how do I say no to the next step? And then I had my mom's head, you know, your voice in my head. Well, boys can't help themselves. I got myself into this situation and I'm downstairs alone. How am I going to get myself out of it? You know, here's, he's this great teacher and he's the superstar of our studio. And I didn't want the love letters to stop. And he's telling me he thinks he's falling in love with me and all that feels great. It, it's an extremely messy, conflicted, confusing time. And I'm 12 and I don't have anybody to talk to about it because now I've done things that I, I know I shouldn't have been doing. So we're like that, like, okay, there's no going back. So at this point, I'm still telling myself it's not that bad. And I, I think that a lot of people who've been through a situation where they were groomed by a trusted person, they're going to nod their heads at this part of the interview and they're going to say, yep, I remember that point when I was saying to myself, it's not that bad because I haven't crossed the actual line. We haven't actually had yeah, you kind of rationalize or minimize or, or, or do whatever you need to do to tolerate this very yucky thing that you're involved in and do not know how to get yourself out of at this point. So for me, a couple of weeks before my 13th birthday, we were painting scenery at the dance studio and he said, oh geez, we're running out of paint. I'm going to have to run to the paint store. And so he got up to go to the paint store and he said, hey, you know, Amber, do you want to ride with me? I'm like, sure. Of course, I'd love to ride with you. I'm so excited that he's even singling me out. I'm still head over heels in love at this point. So instead of going to his truck, we start to head out the door. I think I'm going to the paint store, really. And he goes, oh, I left something upstairs. Come up with me, it'll just take a minute. So I'm following up the back stairs. We get to the top of the stairs and it's his bedroom, actually. They they lived over the, stu the studio, which I didn't know. Shoves me into his bedroom, pins me down on the mattress. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? And he like, ripped my shorts off me and now he's got his shorts and everything off and he's he's over me and he's pushing into me and I, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like I'm, I'm freaking out. Like I almost start crying and he looks at me and he goes, no. And I'm like, oh God, like boys can't help themselves. And he looks at me and he has this look in his eyes and he's like, you mean to tell me no? And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just like my mother said, he's not going to be able to stop. And I look at him and I'm like pleading with my eyes and I'm like just shaking my head at this point. Like I can't even say no. And he does anyway. So he pushes into me. We cross that line. Now I've had, now in my mind, I'm religious. I've gone to teen classes and everything. I'm no longer a virgin. There's no going back from this. He says, he's like, well, you better get dressed. And then he tells me, well, everybody knows what's going on. Everybody downstairs knows that we just had so I'm freaking out that now everybody in the studio knows I'm 12 years old and I've just had for the first time. He's like, they're all going to think you're just a bad girl, which is one of my biggest fears because they know what we were doing up here. You made so much noise. I'm like, oh my God, I have ruined my entire life. So I got to walk back down the stairs, face all the girls that I dance with. And he goes to me, well, you'd better just be my girlfriend or everybody's just going to think you're a bad girl. But if we get married someday, then they'll understand how much we love each other. And I'm 12 and I'm like, okay, so this will be okay in God's eyes if we get married someday. So now I'm going to be his girlfriend. This is going to somehow make it okay. I had to stay and finish painting. I was humiliated. So I had to endure hours of finishing painting scenery with everybody there. And it was awful. But he took me home that night and he said, I know you said no, but your eyes said yes. And I thought, really? Because I'm pretty sure my eyes were begging, begging for you to understand I was really trying to say no. He said, well, I know you said no, but your eyes said yes. So there it was, all my fault. I didn't say no. I let him. It was all my fault. And I thought it was all my fault for years. I mean, if anything, I felt like the last people I would want to know would be my family because I didn't want to disappoint them. I was a good kid. I got good grades. I was in the competition class. After one year, I was in senior competition class. That would have, that would have killed me to have disappointed my family. I thought I can endure this but I cannot endure my family finding out how like low, I felt like the lowest of the low as a human being. I didn't want anybody to know. My best friend at the time, I wrote a book and when my book came out, she's like, Amber, I didn't know how I, I could have been there for you. I just didn't want anybody to know. 
So I spent the next summer, I mean the next few months, that summer, uh, I was his girlfriend. So he just figured we could have whenever he wanted. I just laid there and shut up, tried not to cry every time. And he talked about how it would be all right because we were going to be married someday and it would be okay in God's eyes. And I clung to that idea that if I could just like this and somehow love him and get married someday, it would somehow not be as awful and disgusting as it felt. But he used my own beliefs against me. I, I don't think he really was religious. And I don't think he really cared if he'd ever married me someday. I mean, he really pulled out all the stops about this belief system because he even bought me a necklace where he wore one half and I wore the other. And it said, may the Lord watch over me and thee while we are absent from each other. I mean, he got very religious. But anyway, how it stopped was he turned 18 in August. So that was at the beginning of June. And now this is at the very end of August. And the night of his birthday, because it was his birthday after all, and he wanted to have a good time. It was particularly long. It was particularly demeaning. It was just gross and not what I wanted. And the night of that, I thought, I can't do this anymore. I laid there, he fell asleep afterward. And I just thought, you know what? I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna go unloved the rest of my life. God's gonna hate me and I'm just gonna have to live my life unloved, unlovable, and not even talking to God. But I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm gonna die if I have to lay under this guy one more time. And I think because I was not abused at home, because my family did love me, like prior to all this happening, I think it did give me some resiliency of this is not right. Like, I shouldn't be feeling so miserable that I don't even want to exist. And so that was the night of his birthday. So I broke up with him a week later and I gave him back his necklace and he really cried like big tears. And I just stood my ground and I said, I'm so sorry. I mean, I was apologizing to him. I'm just too young for this kind of a relationship. He seemed sincere that he really didn't want me to, but I, was decided I just couldn't go through that anymore but you know I did being the people pleaser that I was I did say that I hoped he could forgive me someday for breaking up with him <laughs> and I tried hard to be friends I said oh we could be friends and I tried hard to be friendly with him because we danced together I stayed at the studio for several more years I mean I didn't graduate from that dance studio until I was 18 so for five more years, he was my teacher and I danced with him and I stayed friendly and never told anybody and blamed myself. I was in my twenties, so it'd been 10 years until I, I'd gone into counseling for a whole different reason. And the counselor got on, you know, what, what did something happen to you when you were younger? And I ended up telling her, she's the first person I ever told about my first sexual experience, which was with him. And she said, Amber, you were raped. I was like, nope. No, I wasn't. I was stupid. <laughs> I was really stupid. But I wasn't raped. No, I got myself into that situation. But I got myself out of that situation. And I was really stupid. But I could not apply the word rape to myself. I was like, mm -mm, no, that doesn't fit in with Amber. No, that doesn't work for my life. And I was in denial a long time. And I, I couldn't blame him. I just couldn't bring myself to say he he had done something to me that it was his fault. I just couldn't. I just still took that responsibility. I think after maybe a year of counseling, I was in denial for a long time. <laughs> I finally said, he took advantage of me. <laughs> that was as close as I could come to rape. It took a long time long time to heal from this. I did get into therapy. I, I did resolve a lot of issues, although I will say it's been revisited several times. Um, I got married. I adopted two kids, uh, had a family. It's been great. It's been beautiful. You know, uh, same trials and tribulations everybody else has. Currently, I'm 52 years old. I published a book on this called Little Sweetheart because I think of the kids who get caught up in the net of somebody who is trusted, but then manipulates these kids 
in into these situations. I think of those kids as little sweethearts, so just good kids, and and they didn't do anything wrong, although they often feel wrong. They often feel like it was their fault. Um, so I wrote a book about it. It's about my story, but it also talks about healing from it. And it's funny when you're groomed and somebody really twists your your own ideas and uses them against you. You don't go into just straight therapy. You go into something called recovery because it really messes with your your sense of self trust, you know, and it messes with your self concept because um, they they really do take your own beliefs and they twist them in ways that you've got to unravel and say, was that me or was that them? You know, was it my fault or was it their fault? And it takes time. So I've been, you know, I've revisited this. I, re I, I did it in my 20s and I took a break from it. Then something happened, you know, I went through some stuff with um, my kids, which brought up some stuff for me when I was a kid. So then I revisited in my 30s. You know, I, I've like worked at it. And then I think in writing the book, I think I really put a lot of this to rest. And now I actually give talks on... Um, grooming and the cycle of narcissistic abuse and how to protect your organizations from this type of predator that likes to infiltrate you know and be in trusted positions and get close to kids and and perpetrate but in a way that is getting to know the child you know and getting to know the parents because they kind of they trick the parents and groom the parents as much as they do the kids so i actually give talks on prevention I'm actually just about to launch a uh, youtube and TikTok to explain how this cycle occurs and what you can do to prevent this happening in your church or in your soccer club or in your dance studio. You know, I mean, you hear about it in the news all the time. Some some guy that nobody ever suspected and people are just floored and blown away by it. And um, it's something I really understand. I understand it personally, but I also understand how the whole cycle works and, and how you there's prevention points. There's prevention points for people who are people who are educated and know what to look for. There's ways to intervene on behalf of a child because you cannot expect a 12 year old to see it coming or protect themselves or a seven year old or an 18 year old. It's crazy. But when I first um, started working on my own healing, my counselor had me look up Stockholm syndrome. This is an unusual thing. Stockholm syndrome. Like, why would I look that up? But this type of abuser gets you to identify positively with them. Like, so for a time you are identifying very positively and then they turn the tables and start hurting you. And it is hard to like untwist the idea that this person that you have categorized as kind and loving and caring of you is now hurting you. I would say for people who are starting their journey of healing, be kind to yourself. Don't worry about forgiving them. That's on them. That's on, that's their own that they're going to have to own up for someday. Work on you. The only thing that comes to mind that I'd really, really like to say, because I give healing workshops and I give, I give presentations on, on the cycle of this abuse to help understand it. So as prevention, I guess what I'd really like to say is if anybody's out there watching this and something similar happened to them, whether the trusted adult was a family member or whether the trusted adult was somebody in an organization, in my healing workshops, victims always blame themselves, just like I did, always. They always say, no, I think it was me, or I shouldn't have been there, or I shouldn't have got done that, or they always blame themselves. And I, the one thing I would love is for them to consider, you were just a little kid. You're just this little angel. You know, you were like watching cartoons and doing cartwheels in the front lawn and, and you were being goofy and silly. And that person did trick you. They knew when they targeted you that they had two games running. They had this love bombing game where they were being silly with you and telling you not knock jokes and nothing lewd, nothing that would scare you away. But they knew where this was gonna end up. They had two games running and it wasn't your fault. It, they knew it from the very beginning when they targeted you. I would love for people 
who've been a victim of this to really own that and to stop blaming themselves. I, I wish so much I could get that message out because they're just good little kids and it wasn't their fault. I really would love to get that message out.